Hi ladies, I'm so excited to be concluding um, the chapters in Hebrews, chapter 12 and 13. So I will go ahead and pray for us and we will get started. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your word, specifically your word in Hebrews. I thank you how, for how it's challenged us, encouraged us, God. I pray that um, you would help me to speak with clarity um, as I do the best to share what you have given me. I pray that each woman will receive what you have for her. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so as I stated, I'm excited to be wrapping up our study with the final two chapters of Hebrews, chapters 12 and 13. And here, the author is about to wrap up his letter with a lot of rich practical application for the dense theology he's provided us thus far. So last week, we looked at Hebrews 11, which includes the famous Hall of Faith. Some of the names mentioned were include Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and that's just to name a few. And what does anyone do when they're wanting to make a case for something or add credibility to their claim? They say things like, you can go ask so-and-so or so-and-so was there, they'll tell you. And that's exactly what the author did in chapter 11. And in chapter 12, he picks up with the same concept Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, right? So we have all of these examples of individuals in scriptures who believed in the promised one to come and God proved himself faithful to them. So since we have these examples, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily entangles us and run with endurance the race that set before us. So the author is using the imagery of running a race, and that likely would have really resonated with the original hearers and readers of this text, probably more so than it would today for us. In first century Roman and Greek culture, athletic games were very popular. As a matter of fact, what we know as the Olympics today derived from these games. And when running a race then, and even now, it would have been foolish for the runner to add weight to themselves, right? It would slow them down and it would have negative impacts on their ability to endure till the end. So in regards to our spiritual race, the author of Hebrews was calling them to lay aside every weight. So for them, they were still carrying the weight of trying to practice and live out the old covenant and he's telling them to lay that aside. So for us, that's not necessarily the weight that we're dealing with, but we definitely have some weights that we carry around. So what about how weighty it can feel trying to be the perfect mom or how weighty it can feel trying to be the perfect wife, how weighty it can be trying to be the perfect employee. It's weighty trying to do life outside of Christian community. It's weighty trying to be everything for everyone else. Lay aside these weights and the sin that our flesh has told us is better than Jesus. We sometimes just have a hard time shaking it, but lay it aside, tear down those strongholds. And verse two is a great reminder that even though we have such a great cloud of witness, they are not our heroes per se. They are not the ones that we should be looking to. They are a testament and witness to the source of our faith. They too were looking to the promised one in their case before he came and took on flesh. And we are looking to the promised one who has now come in the flesh, fulfilled his earthly ministry perfectly and is seated at the right hand of the father. He is the author of our faith and the foundation and the finish of our, finisher of our faith, the one who will see this good work through to completion. We are looking to his example of endurance. He endured because of the joy that was set before him. So we too can endure because of the joy set before us. And why do we need to look to Jesus and meditate on what he's done? Verse three tells us so we don't get discouraged and weary. In this life, we are going to deal with things that will make us discouraged or make us feel discouraged and weary and these days, in order to feel like all you have to do is turn on the news, right? And you'll see something that will lead you to feel discouraged or weary. But we look to Jesus who endured far more than we ever will, 
And he does assure us, yes, in this life, you will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. And that's why we can endure because we're coming from the victory. So back to the imagery of the runner running the race. And in those times, um, most people that were of noble nobility or, or wealth, um, they were born into that likely or descended from a royal or noble family. But athletes could rise to prominence and nobility due to their success in the games. So there was a lot at stake when they were running these races in their mind, they were likely thinking if I win, the benefits that's going to be afforded to me. But we as believers, we are a win, when we win, right? We know what's awaiting us because the victory has already been won. So then the author goes on to talk about discipline and he quotes Proverbs 3, 11 through 12, which says, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. And he goes on to assure us, the author in Hebrews does, that God disciplines us because we are his daughters. Don't we discipline our children? Absolutely. And even in seeking the Lord to do that in the best way that we can, in a God-honoring way, we are still going to fall short in that. So knowing that we should willfully submit to the discipline of our Heavenly Father because He does it perfectly. So let's talk about discipline for just a bit. As Christians, we should not hear the word discipline and think of punishment because those in Christ do not stand to receive God's punishment. God has already poured out his wrath on Jesus Christ. But instead, we should think about discipline as correction and instruction. God's correction can feel painful, but he's still gentle though, right? And likewise, God's instruction can seem painful, right? The instruction he gives us in his word, he tells us, crucify your flesh, forgive those who sin against you, don't seek the treasures of this world, even though they're all around, right? In that relationship, you ain't supposed to be in. Apologize when you're wrong. None of these things are easy. They can be very painful. But both the correction and the instruction of the Lord, as painful as it can be, yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And that's what we want, right? To walk worthy of the calling with which we were called. We were called to Christ's righteousness, not because of what we've done, but because of him. So submit to discipline so that we may, we may live in a way that brings him glory. Picking up in verse 12, the author deals with the spiritual exhaustion that can come with enduring and being trained by discipline. He tells them to strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. The New Living Translation says, take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. And hearing those words, it made me think about what the author said a couple chapters back in 10, when he said, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. So strengthen that grip, hold fast and strengthen those knees. And I'm talking about spiritual knees because some of us may feel as if we can't do anything to strengthen um, our physical knees. So I like how um, the one commentary author put it when talking about make straight your path, right? The next thing the author says is make straight your path. One commentary author said, arrange our lives so that sin opportunities to ensnare us are significantly reduced. So sin struggle ain't going away this side of heaven, right? But we can certainly be diligent to guard our hearts and flee temptation. We do this so we will be strengthened in those areas in which we're weak and not further handicapped. That's what that passage is saying. Next, the author instructs us to pursue peace with all people. All people, right? People who look different, live different, vote different, worship Jesus different. And since the author said all people, let me just keep it real right. Also, people who don't love Jesus, who don't keep his commands. Now, this scripture isn't saying to compromise what we believe for the sake of pursuing peace. But we can't go around offending people with what I like to call as some Christian arrogance. Right. The gospel is going to offend people. No doubt. Jesus said it would. But don't let the offense be your attitude and your delivery. 
And also note that the passage says pursue peace and not achieve peace, right? We not gonna achieve peace with everyone, but we are certainly called to pursue it. And we do that by keeping the ultimate message of peace at the front of our minds. And that is that we were once enemies of God, not at peace with him, but now through Christ, we have peace with him. He also said pursue holiness, which goes hand in hand with what he said earlier about laying aside the weight and sin. So in verse 15, the author is talking about the accountability that we have to each other as believers. So we don't technically hold non-believers accountable for sin in the same way in which we would hold other believers. To non-believers, we preach a message of hope, Christ crucified, there's forgiveness. But to a believer, we are instructed to hold each other accountable for our sin. It is biblical, right? But so many of us, myself included, have mastered the art of selectively seeking out accountability. And when I say selective, I'm not talking about being selective in who we seek out for accountability, because I do think that there is wisdom in being selective about who we go deep with. But I'm more so talking about we can be selective in what sin issues we seek accountability for. We pick and choose, right? What we wanna share and what we don't. I'm not saying that you share everything, but we can't hold on to sin and avoid accountability because we don't wanna let it go. So I'ma just leave it at that and y'all can chew on that for a bit. And then he goes on to warn about three specific things, a root of bitterness springing up, sexual immorality, and godless behavior, and on that one, he refers to Esau. So why these three things for a warning? So I can't get inside of the mind of the author of Hebrews, but I have some speculation as to why he may have chose these three things to warn us about. He said a root of bitterness can defile many, and I've seen that in the body of believers, two believers that have opposing views and the opposition gets so strong, they get so bitter that it can bring division in the church. So he's warning us against that bitterness. Next, sexual immorality, right? So Jesus suffered the same penalty for all sin. All sin is deserving of the same punishment from God but sexual immorality is especially damaging. And I know we've all seen it. We've seen how it's torn families apart, what it does, how hurtful it can be, um, how it can impact, it just impacts so many things in so many ways, a warning against that. And then lastly, godless, and he references Esau. So what's the point he's making here, right? What did Esau do? When he made that poor decision to sell his birthright, all he was focusing on was his temporary discomfort. He lost sight of how sacred and valuable his birthright was. And in Hebrew culture, birthright was a really, really big deal. And he lost sight of that. And the consequences were devastating. And he wanted to undo it. He desperately did. He wept over it but he couldn't change it. He couldn't go back and undo the decision that he made. And we have to be so careful, ladies, to not do the same thing. We can't let the light momentary afflictions of this world make you lose sight of Jesus and where your hope lies. So next, the author recounts the events that are documented in Exodus 19. And I encourage you to go back and read it if you haven't. So what it's talking about is something that transpired at Mount Sinai and it went down that day. The ground was shaking. There was thunder and lightning. Mountains was, or the mountain was covered in smoke, a trumpet blast. And it scared the children of Israel so much that they told Moses, oh, we, we don't want to hear from God. Just you tell us we, we can't take it to hear from God. They were so scared. This is recounting the, the story of when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And the readers of Hebrews would have been very familiar with this account. And ultimately, at Mount Sinai, God was saying, stay back. I'm holy. You can't come up to me, right? I shake mountains. I, I <laughs> rumble the ground. There's thunder. There's lightning. An animal can't even touch this mountain. So the author reminds them of the event that day and says, but you haven't come to Mount Sinai. You've come to Mount Zion. 
God is not saying, get back, I'm holy. He's saying, come. Now, don't get it twisted, right? Like, same God in Mount Sinai, same God today. But because of what Christ has done, he's saying, come. He's now saying, he's saying, my son fulfilled everything at Mount Sinai, so you can now draw near at Mount Zion. It's a figurative description. So the author closes chapter 12 by continuing with the image of Mount Sinai versus Mount Zion. And he pretty much says, now bear with me, right? This is like a modern day joy translation, but here we go. This is what the, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what the author is saying. So you see back then, your ancestors couldn't escape God speaking on Mount Sinai. They couldn't escape the terrifying display of God's might, power, and holiness. They couldn't refuse the law that he was giving to his people. Well, if you think Mount Sinai was intense, Wait till he comes back to shake heaven and earth. Just like they couldn't escape what was happening at Mount Sinai, ain't nobody escaping what's happening on the day Jesus cracks the sky. He is going to bring such a shaking that this whole earth is going to pass away and all that will remain will be the new Jerusalem, a city that cannot be shaken, a city in which those in Christ have citizenship, that's us, y'all. We're going to dwell in this city. And since we know we are receiving this new kingdom and everything on this earth is passing away, let us receive the grace God has given us and serve him rightly with reverence and fear. May we worship God in deep gratitude for the grace that we've received, but also in awe of reverence, because like I said, the same God that shook Mount Sinai is the same God we serve today, and our God is a consuming fire. Okay, so now on to chapter 13. He starts this chapter out with the charge to let brotherly love continue. And why is this important? Because the world will know who we are by the way we love each other. The world will know we belong to Jesus and how we show love to one another. And then, of course, right, because he's God and he cares about all image bearers, he charges us to um, show love to strangers, to be kind and hospitable to strangers. Because we could be entertaining angels. I have to admit, I've sometimes wondered, like, I wonder how, if I really, if I have entertained angels. But, okay. Okay. So then he says, remember those in prison as if it were us. So in the original context, he was likely referring to people that were in prison for preaching the gospel. But we are still not excused from this command today. Remember those that are in prison. He reminds us again about the importance of everyone, single and married, honoring the marriage, honoring marriage in the marriage bed. And then he talks about covetous, covetousness specifically in regards to the love of money. And the Bible is certainly consistent with this exhortation to not love money. So again, let's think of the original hearers and how they would have processed this and what would have been significant to them. They are being called, the author's charging them and calling them to follow Christ, to preach Christ crucified, and preaching that message could cost them everything. And the author, so the author's reminding them don't love money or covet the life of comfort that an access of money can bring. They probably was going to lose a lot of that. He goes on to quote Deuteronomy 31, six and Psalms 118, six through seven. And those passages remind them that God is never going to leave them or forsake them and that the Lord is their help. So what can man do to them? If they do lose everything, if they're persecuted, if they're thrown in prison, what can man ultimately do? Cause they can't take away the blessed assurance we have of the city to come. So yes, they can take away all your possessions and you may find yourself in prison and in chains, but when you know you have a kingdom that cannot be shaken, you can confidently say, what can man do to me? So next, the author tells them to remember their spiritual leaders and the word of God that they have been taught by them. He also tells them to consider the example their leaders have set by the way they live their life. And y'all, thanks be to God that at Forest Baptist Church, we have teachers and spiritual leaders and pastors that not only teach us the truth by what they say, but they teach us the truth in how they live. We must never take that for granted. So after telling them to think about the spiritual example their leaders have set, he makes it clear that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. 
the message of the gospel does not change. So don't get caught up in different teachings that have either deviated away from the truth of the gospel or have said the gospel plus something else. Not biblical. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So for the original hearers, he goes on to reference the Old Testament food rituals that they had to follow that would have resonated with them. But what are some of the strange and various teachings that we may be tempted to believe today? Now, I don't believe any of us would bow down to a carbon image or if there was a message directly against who the triune God is and what Jesus did. I feel like we could recognize that. But the enemy is subtle and sneaky and it comes in ways that we have to be really mindful to not get carried away with. Right. A common theme that we hear living your best life now. If you go to a sermon and it's all about the, the prosperity and the, the things you're going to achieve and Christ crucified isn't mentioned. Be mindful. Don't get carried away in that teaching. Here lately, I've also heard a lot of talk around um, ancestors, right? And I think there is a lot of opportunity to recognize and appreciate and learn about our ancestors. But I'm not pulling power from anywhere but Jesus, right? So if you hear things like the power that we have in our ancestors, question that because the Bible says the power that raised Jesus from the dead is what lived in, lives in us and nothing compares to that. So be mindful. Don't be carried away with strange teachings. There's plenty more examples I can give, but I'll just keep it at those too. Okay, so verses 10 through 14 provides more imagery of how everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. The bodies of the animals used for sin offerings, um, the sin offering sacrifices were burned outside of the gate. That points to Christ being crucified outside of the city gates. In verse 13, the author charges the readers and us to go outside the city gates. Go ye therefore, right? Making disciples, bearing his repro reproach. Remember, Jesus said, they hated me, they gonna hate you too. So, but we bear that reproach that our savior did because we're keeping in mind the city that cannot be shaken that is awaiting us. So we offer continual sacrifices of praise to God with the fruit of our lips. God don't want them animal sacrifices anymore, right? He wants a living sacrifice in us. He's called us to be a living sacrifice. And thanking, thanking him with the fruit of our lips goes beyond just singing songs on Sunday morning and lifting up our hands or even shouting, which those things are beautiful expressions of worship. Nor do I think the author is telling us to go around like, you know, Jesus, hallelujah, Jesus, Jesus. I don't I mean, I ain't gonna knock nobody if that's how you feel you need to operate. But that's not what he's necessarily saying either. But instead, everything that comes out of our mouth, the fruit of our lips should edify our Lord and show our recognition of who he is. Right. OK, so verse 17 in the joy translation again. Right. He's talking about how we should look at our leaders, our spiritual leaders. So Joy's Joy's paraphrase words from what scripture says, our leaders have a weighty responsibility of keeping watch over our souls. They will have to give an account for how they kept watch over our souls. That is weighty. Right. We can't make it hard for them, y'all, unnecessarily nitpicking on insignificant stuff, complaining about trivial stuff. So we ain't called to just blindly submit, right, to whatever they say and praise God that we have leadership that invites the congregation to share thoughts, ideas, and feedback. But let's make sure it's helpful, right, and constructive and not us just being extra over stuff that in the grand scheme of things ain't that big of a deal, right? And not only do we not need to make our leaders' jobs harder, but we also need to pray for them. They want to live honorably, like the author of Hebrews says, when they are standing before God on judgment day, giving an account for how they shepherded our souls, they want to hear, well done, our good and faithful servant. And that is weighty, right, to carry that. And the author says, I especially urge you to pray, right? And that is the only thing that he has said do with urgency. So may we commit to praying for our leaders. And now the benediction. And I have to admit that sometimes I read past this pretty quick, <laughs> but I took some time with it because there's so much there. And there was one phrase that I was particularly drawn to. It says, now may the peace of God, or the God of peace, excuse me, now may the God of peace. And why is he the God of peace? Ultimately, because he made a way for sinners 
like you and me who were once enemies of him, to be at peace with him through him. Amen. Because Jesus is the incarnate God, right? God, man. So ultimately, because he's made a way for you and me, we have peace with God, right? So what I hear sometimes, like again, I'm just a lot of things that I hear about peace. I feel like there's another big push that I will cut off anybody who's disturbing my peace. My peace, I'm gonna protect my peace. I'm guilty of telling my children to not disturb the peaceful enjoyment of my space. And so many people out here that are, are saying these things, not that there's, I don't wanna dismiss them as if there's no like wisdom or anything or this all bad, but sometimes I think people are unaware of the fact that the main one they need to be at peace with, they've completely overlooked, right? They need to be at peace with God because at the end of the world, at the end of the age, it ain't gonna matter how much protecting of their peace that they did if they wasn't at peace with God. Okay, so the readers of Hebrews knew a God of wrath that they couldn't draw near to, right? But now the author is inviting them and praying for them to experience the God of peace. Now, God doesn't stop being a God of wrath, right? He doesn't change. That attribute doesn't go away. But now we are just experiencing the peace of God in a way because of what Christ has done that they didn't, that the original hearers didn't. So I'm just going to read his final, the author's final benediction. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the internal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Christ Jesus, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, but that ain't the end, right? It's like he said, amen, but one more thing, one more quick thing. He says, bear with this word of exhortation. And I love that he calls it a word of exhortation because you could look at how dense theologically this text was and see it maybe as just a lecture uh, to talk about the differences between the old covenant and the new covenant. But ultimately, is it, an, it is an well thought, well written exhortation to see Jesus Christ as better. The best thing we could ever have, honestly. He then goes on to provide an update on Timothy and then passes on brotherly love like he instructed us to do by telling them to greet everyone who is there and their spiritual leaders. And then he shares the greetings of those that he is with. So this whole book of Hebrews is a beautiful picture of the grace extended to us through the new covenant. Amazing grace, right? How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So with that, I'll just close with the author's ending words. And he said, grace be with you all. Amen.